Hey fools, I'm joined by Rich Barden, who, if you haven't heard of him, is one of the more prominent venture capitalists having started companies such as Expedia, Zillow, and Glassdoor now. Um, so quite the track record. Um, but I wanted to begin kind of our conversation. We're an investment company. So just beginning by talking about your investment uh, philosophy, kind of what the- As a venture capitalist or as a, as a stock investor? Um, well, I mean, as a person who invests in great companies okay. in general. All right. So what, what's kind of the common thread among these companies? Uh, for me, so you called me a venture capitalist, which I am kind of on the side, but I primarily think of myself as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, I, I started Expedia and I ran that for 10 years uh, before it was sold and then I left and I, I ran Zillow for the first six or seven years and started, started Zillow up. Um, at Glassdoor, I've never had a, an executive role there. I'm, I'm a co-founder and the chairman, but I like to build companies and build teams. So I don't actually go into these things thinking about what makes a great investment. I think what makes a great company. Mm -hmm. um, and what makes a great company in the consumer internet space for me uh, is something that I call power to the people. Mm -hmm. uh, I am very excited about uh, providing new software uh, new sites and new apps that give consumers power that they didn't have before to make really big, scary decisions in their lives, maybe exciting decisions as well that involve money, uh, so that they can make those de decisions better. That's what Expedia was about, kind of throwing back the curtains on these kind of Byzantine reservation systems that ran the travel industry and handing it to you to do yourself. Yeah. That was powerful. With Zillow, same thing, handing to you and to my mom and my sisters the, the ability to really have a godlike, data-rich view of the whole of the real estate industry and know what that house is worth and know which one sold when and be able to go around the neighborhood on your mobile app and have this incredible view of the whole market. That's, that's a view that that regular people didn't have before Zillow mm -hmm. came along. Um, Glassdoor is the same kind of thing. We're kind of throwing back the curtains on a world of really sensitive, interesting information about salaries and what it's like to work at a company and interview questions and CEO approval ratings and, and giving that to regular folks so that they can be empowered. So for me, that's like a, a, a really winning thesis, playing on people's innate sense of uh, wanting to be revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. uh, you combine those ideas with killer teams of people and magic things happen. Great, good description. Um, let's talk about your uh, kind of current company that you're gearing up, which is Glassdoor, as you just mentioned. And you recently secured a $70 million financing round, I believe. Yes. Um, what's, what's that money going towards? Kind of what's the final vision that you're trying to achieve with Glassdoor? Well, at Glassdoor, where, again, I'm, I'm uh, the chairman, but I'm not executive, uh, a great team of people down in Sausalito, California, run that, led by uh, Robert Homan, who is the CEO. Robert is a guy who um, uh, worked with me at Expedia as a development manager and rose through the ranks and now, now has his own company and is really kicking butt. Uh, so as you said, Eric, we recently did a kind of a late stage round of financing of $70 million. Uh, and the goal of Glassdoor is really connecting people with the jobs and the companies they love. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, our, that's our, our really big mission. We want to help people find and get better jobs uh, at the right companies that are the right fit for them. Mm -hmm. um, and so this new slug of capital uh, enables us to take this great product that we've built uh, and really begin to accelerate it uh, beyond the U.S. and around the world. So we're, we're, we're we already have a good chunk of our 23 million unique users who come a month that come from overseas, but we haven't really uh, uh, rolled out many localized, language localized sites for Glassdoor. Uh, and as you might imagine, a user generated content site like Glassdoor really scales globally quite nicely. And so this, this $70 million is about taking Glassdoor around the world. Gotcha. And let's uh, kind of take a step back and look at the macro view. I was at CES this past week, and there's yeah. virtual reality goggles everywhere, drones. It's yeah. an exciting time across technology. As you look across the space, what are you really excited about in 2015? Um, what am I excited about? Um, I mean, you know, the smart, you, you, we might think that the smartphone and mobile computing and, and you know, touchscreen thing has played out because there are now 
I don't know. How many how many devices were activated in the last year? A billion? Over a billion you know, smartphones a, a sold billion, a year. Okay, so a billion d new devices were activated. That seems like a pretty big number. You know what? Those numbers are going to get bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, and I consider the applications that, that companies like mine have built that sit on top of this new incredible magic platform are really just the beginning of what's going to be possible. Mm -hmm. We've kind of, I think we've just really begun to scratch the surface for the kinds of interconnectivity and monitoring and location-based stuff and payments and you know this is really just started so I think that what I'm most excited about is where where the platform of today is actually headed mm -hmm. yes there are new platforms that are coming in the in, in goggles and wearables and and drone things I don't see any of those really impacting my businesses for quite some time yeah and let's let's keep talking about that connected yeah. track because yeah. You know, the numbers are 50 billion connected devices by 2020. Yeah. There's something kind of scary to consumers, but as far as you talk about with power to people, yeah. if you look at industries that could be impacted, like healthcare, yeah. where you may be seeing some opportunities to kind of move your investment philosophy where maybe you didn't really have access to kind of ungating data previously. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, healthcare is an interesting one. I have I have one startup that I'm on the board of called Real Self, mm -hmm. that is kind of trip advisor for cosmetic procedures and is doing really really well. It's a serious site where people, largely women, go to talk to other women and share their stories that they've had with cosmetic procedures. And there's a, a really healthy and constructive uh, influence of the people who perform the procedures, the doctors, and 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 the other professionals who perform these procedures intermingling in this kind of information marketplace to throw back the curtains and dispel you know inaccuracies and make people understand and comfortable um, so that one is is a small part of healthcare but I see that working really well there my guess is power to the people is going to work across healthcare um, I also think that this this um, that humans have a almost infinite capacity for gazing in the digital mirror Mm -hmm. Like we want to look at ourselves and render ourselves as data. We like looking in the mirror anyway. Most yeah. people do, you know, regardless, most people do. And if we can look in the digital mirror, which is being held up to us now by the Fitbits and the smartphones and soon the Apple Watch and all these devices that we wear that monitor our heart rates and our steps and our, you know, everything, our sleep. Yeah. Um, you know, that is all this data coming back from the digital mirror at us and that absolutely is an input to better health care but it's an input to something else too that I haven't quite figured out um, but it's 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 pretty interesting and appealing to people it, it may seem a little bit narcissistic but I think it's a trend that's going to continue yeah I'm yeah mildly addicted to playing yeah. it but um, <laughs> I, I went through the phase I, I had the I wore the Nike band for maybe a year and I liked it. I liked what it made me, th how it made me think. But for whatever reason, it dropped off. I mean, my guess is the, I'm sure I'll get an Apple Watch, and my guess is that one will be a little bit stickier. Yeah, it is. It, I think the average is wearable devices stop being used after four months. Is that so right? There's a problem that people figure out their habits. Yeah. But you think about kind of medical applications where someone with a chronic health problem could consistently wear it, and yeah. uh, it, it's really incredible. Yeah, sure. But uh, moving on to kind of a new industry that. Yeah has its own challenges. We're a financial services company. Okay. No one likes the industry. Yeah. I was wondering what your opinion would be, where you see the future going, because uh, we've actually seen a lot of action for the first time in a long time with innovative companies in the space, uh, getting a lot of buzz, such as robo-advisors. Uh -huh. What are your feelings about uh, where finance might be headed and kind of some of the new technologies that are starting to get funding behind them? You know, I don't, I'm not certain about what the, the robo-advisors. I assume that's like you know, basket of ETFs, robotically chosen. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, you know, most investors probably, that's a great product for them, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Warren Buffett, you know, says the most important thing, or, you know, he says lots of interesting things, but these, <laughs> the expense that, that a regular investor pays is, you know, you know, likely the single most important factor in long-term returns, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I assume these robo-advisors are, are, are doing things for, 0.25 percent or fees. Okay, like maybe even less. 15 basis points. Who knows, mm -hmm. right? And that's good. Uh, that's good. And and the average person's ability to try to pick stocks and time it properly. I mean, mm, that is a that's a trail of tears, mm -hmm. right? People people who are picking stocks themselves, 
maybe they pick the right stocks, but they probably don't trade in and out of them at the right times. It's mm -hmm. hard. It's you know, it's hard to really hold on to something when it's down and not just hold, add to it. Um, so I, I think the robo thing might be pretty might be pretty interesting. But in general, in financial services, I think that this power to the people concept is a is is a really you know potentially powerful one. I mean, I I was a very early fool reader and 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 tele te, what was it called? Telebroker at Charles Schwab. So Charles mm -hmm. Schwab, before there was the web, had this thing called Telebroker, and I actually entered trades on my on my touchstone phone. This is before you were yeah. doing stuff like this. But so I've been a stock investor for a long time, uh, and you know the first step towards empowering regular investors to do more was Charles Schwab and mm -hmm. E-Trade and, and and all these others, and that's been a pretty interesting uh, progression. I think the regular investor is much more informed now. You know, Motley Fool being a contributing factor sure. there. Um, so they're, they're, they're much better informed. I don't know that they're making all that be much better decisions, but they're, they're much more empowered. Um, there are pockets, there are vast swaths of the financial services industries that are the industry that is still in the dark, though, say municipal bonds. I mean, the way munis trade um, is anybody's guess, mm -hmm. and, and, and that probably is a business that needs to have the curtains drawn back, and there are probably 10 others that are not consumer-oriented that need to as well. Technology, connected technology, connected ubiquitous technology, uh, um, is a like gravitational force on pulling back the curtains, and so I think we'll see that happen. Sounds about right. Um, one thing I actually kind of wanted to step back. I I follow you on Twitter. Okay. And one tweet that caught Thank my you. eye <laughs> was uh, you had said the Sony hack equal Franz Ferdinand question mark uh, yeah, yeah. or something similar to that. So I'm a natural optimist, but yeah. one of the kind of areas that people are rightfully kind of cautious of is security issues around basically putting our lives on the internet. So yeah. I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on uh, maybe some opportunities there and how that will kind of affect a lot of these developments in the next three, four years. It's not my bag. I, I'm an optimist too, so I don't like to invest and spend time on things that are pessimistic by nature. Mm -hmm. And the security industry is kind of pessimistic. It's full of people who are, woo, scare you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's a big business right now though. Yeah. It's a big business in venture and it, as rightly it should. Uh, because um, quite obviously we need to be getting a lot better at securing our data and our information against not just attack but against um, you know benign use as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a big, uh, clearly that's a big area of investment. For me, I'm just not interested in it. Gotcha. Uh, so so I don't do it. My my power alley is pretty narrow. I like what I like. Mm -hmm. You know, I like consumer stuff. I like building consumer brands. I like internet. You know, smartphone stuff. Um, I don't really like B2B stuff, even though there are huge businesses that can be built there. It's just not what I like to spend my time on. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, we'll go back into the power alley here okay. and talk about um, you sat on the board of Netflix. Yes. And I was uh, curious about some of your thoughts heading into the next year. One announcement that really caught my eye in the past week was actually ESPN going uh, digital that you can now subscribe without a cable package. Who did that? Dish or something? Uh, Dish actually got so it. Sling. It's right? called Sling TV, but yeah. it's not. But from they bought Sling. D D Dish bought Sling Box, and anyway, okay. it's yeah. a confusing mess. Okay. As all right. media is. Right. But um, I was curious what your thoughts would be about kind of the future of that, and kind of where you see Netflix headed, because that's a it's a long time investment from the Motley Fool. I believe it's a 30, 30 fold gainer for many of their investors. So they're watching and kind of seeing. Kind of what's the next disruptive potential for the company? Where do you see them head over the next three, four years? Well, I'm not a spokesman for Netflix, obviously, but I've been involved for a long time, happily. Um, Reed Hastings and the leadership team at Netflix is one of the great teams I've ever had the privilege of working with. They really are phenomenally smart, uh, ph phenomenally ethical, mm -hmm. uh, and phenomenally ambitious. Um, and, uh, you know, I think Netflix has in the order, I won't, I won't get the number quite right, but 50 million subscribers around the, streaming subscribers around the world right now. And, you know, it's the company's ambition to grow that to be much larger. Mm -hmm. And there are many lands to go. There are many lands to conquer as we roll Netflix out around the world. Uh, and the team is really smart about that. 
you know, as, as new countries are launched, uh, we, we stub our toes sometimes, we learn, we adjust, and, and, and we keep at it. And, you know, the international rollout of Netflix is the exciting growth thing. Um, and uh, it's going, uh, you know, from my perspective, going quite well. I'm also quite, quite amazed that this team was able to cross the chasm from the DVD world to the streaming world. Mm -hmm. I remember when, I st when, when Reed was recruiting me onto the board back in 2000 or 2001, it was a DVD by mail company, yeah. and I was very skeptical. I was like, come on, I mean, this form factor is over. It's going to hit the wall. And he said, Rich, we didn't name the company DVD by mail flex. We named it Netflix because we will figure out how to get across the chasm. And you know what? He, he, he figured it out. And then finally, the third great unbelievable thing about Netflix, which everybody's now aware of and is kind of internalized really quickly, is that Netflix is creating now some of the best television content, some of the best video content in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and Orange is the New Black and House of Cards and Marco Polo. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are, this is really, really good stuff and it's coming out of Netflix this original content, and it has changed the consuming world's perception of what Netflix is from kind of a, a distributor to a creator, and this has been an incredible boon for the brand. So I'm a very happy board director and a very uh, very happy shareholder of the company. All right, and I guess it wouldn't be a kind of tech interview today if I didn't ask about Uber. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't, I'm not involved with Uber. Uh, as, as an outsider, though, oh, yeah. what, are, what are your kind of thoughts of the growth of, you know, sharing economy, yeah. number one? And number two, I believe it's recent valuation put at about $40 billion. I think so. So I just wanted to get your it's opinion important. as kind of a, so to say, insider. Yeah. What, what you're thinking about valuations, does anything concern you with what you're seeing? Because uh, to your average person, some things are looking a little frothy, but... Are you more optimistic on uh, kind of these companies being able to grow into these very high valuations? Well, the average person can't really invest in these private rounds that get that, that you know in, in, in Uber and Snapchat and you know these kinds of things that, that are getting so much attention. So it's actually not doesn't really matter that much to the mm -hmm. average person. The average person can invest in public companies. Yeah. And you know I don't know how things look to you there, but you know. There are some things that might feel a little frothy, but uh, in general, I think it's pretty rational. It's certainly very rational in, in my world relative to what it was like in 1999. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so we're not seeing that in the public markets. In the private markets, we just don't know. We don't know what the numbers are, mm -hmm. right? My guess is that Uber is a gigantic company growing faster than anybody's ever seen. Mm -hmm. That's my guess. And my guess as a user of Uber you know, is that it's not changing the taxi cab business, it's changing the transportation business. Mm -hmm. um, I use Uber every day. And I don't have to get rid of my car because I can afford to have it, but if I, if I were making that trade off, I might get rid of my car. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a whole new generation of people who are being brought up in the so-called sharing economy, it's really kind of a renting economy, um, you know, are, are, are gonna maybe not buy cars. Because yeah. they don't have to buy cars because they have a car on demand whenever they want. And it's clean and it's driven by somebody friendly who they get to rate after they, they ride and who rates them after they ride. So we have a much more civil interaction that happens between these people than what we've had in the past with a car and driver relationship. Um, this is a revolutionary idea, Uber. And I, you know, I'm excited to see how it plays out globally and just how important it becomes. My guess is that $40 billion valuation is, is easily justifiable. And you, you touched on this a little bit. We advise and we give information to people investing in public companies. One shift I've seen, Facebook, it didn't go public until it was already a yeah. $100 billion company, Uber, $40 billion. Yeah. What do you think the long-term impact on this will be for public investors that it feels like there's been a shift when companies are going public later and later. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on kind of that general theme. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a few standout companies that are waiting, you know, and uh, maybe this trend was kicked off by Google, mm -hmm. you know, and it's gone right through several, you know, Facebook and Twitter and now the big private companies, Uber and what have you. Um, it's not that many companies. Not many companies uh, can afford, can have that much um, power relative to their investors and their employees to stay private for that long. Mm -hmm. uh, only the really exceptional growers and exceptionally large, fast-growing companies 
uh, can do that. And they can do that because they can keep their investors at bay because their investors know they're going to get paid out. They can keep their employees at bay as well who they've comped with stock. Uh, it, and, and say, look, we're going we're gonna to have a pseudo-liquid market for you if you really want to leave, but just, just hang on, we're going to get there, hang with us. And as well, those companies that stay private like that, they actually do have kind of a currency that they can use to acquire companies too. So they have that optionality of using their stock to acquire companies. Most, com most private companies don't have that luxury because they are not Uber and Facebook. You know, most companies need to, most com the companies I've taken public, Expedia and Zillow, companies that just went public, you know, in the last, in the last month, um, you know, the Hadoop, uh, you know, Hortonworks uh, and New Relic, mm -hmm. okay? The, these are companies that are going public at about the right time, at about the rational time, you know, maybe printing at 500 million and hopefully trading up to a billion in valuation, something, something in that round. The, the, there's going to be a lot more of that inventory coming into the Motley Fool and into your customers' hands in this in this in twenty fifteen. I would guess more inventory of that coming coming in twenty fifteen than we've seen since nineteen ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I guess uh, I'd like to talk for a second too about Zillow. We're yeah, good. Sitting underneath. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're. I'm sure you've chatted with other people at Zillow already. So we have. So I guess yeah. I'd just like yeah. to get you founded the company. What do you think buying a home is like in ten years? How is this going to be different? How will this process continue to evolve? Ah, okay. Um, well, we're, we're entering a phase. We entered. We moved with Zillow. We moved from a phase of the consumer has limited information to who's shopping for a home and has to get all their information from a professional uh, to a kind of super super informed consumer. This consumer has a ton of information, context information, can build their own spreadsheets and do their own math and know what's going on in the market. We then, and that was step one for Zillow. The next step was taking that mobile. We didn't have a mobile product until the iPhone, uh, until actually an iPhone that could handle our maps uh, came out. And so when the iPhone that could handle, that could handle a map-based interface well came out, and I don't know what year that was. It'd be interesting, it's probably pretty recent. <laughs> Uh, 2008, eight, eight or nine. GPS, yeah, yeah, okay, but a map rendering thing. Anyway, the next phase was to take that desktop real estate shopping experience and take it and put it on the iPhone while you're mobile, while you're walking around the neighborhood shopping mm -hmm. or driving around. And then you can open Zillow up and look, hold it up and look at the houses all around and know everything. Okay, that was a game changer for Zillow. And now the large majority of activity that happens on Zillow from users, it happens on uh, happens on smartphones. Uh, and so now where do we go from here? Well, these devices uh, are, are really good at connecting people and we shop as groups. And it, a, a very interesting direction we're heading is trying to take these natural groups that form around home shopping and have everybody know what everybody knows. Uh, and that should be a big, you know, that should be a big advance. Another one is the trafficking of all these documents and processes that swirl around the main line of buying a house. You know, are you pre-qualified? Are you getting a mortgage? Did you get the inspection? All this paper intensive title insurance, all this stuff that needs to happen, that all has a really interesting opportunity to be much more digitally smooth. Yeah. Uh, and so that's a big, there's a big win there. Um, you know, a, a really interesting offshoot of that for us is the mortgage business. Uh, and so we have a, re at Zillow, we have a really fantastic, like the very best place to shop for and buy a mortgage, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not on or off the web, is in Zillow Mortgages. It's a really unbelievably consumer-friendly marketplace uh, where you get great service and great prices on mortgages. So that we're, do we're doing a good job at. There's another one as well in the rental business. Uh, we're making a big investment in rentals. People are shopping and shopping for rentals and homes simultaneously. They've never really been able to do that before in one place. They can now do that in one place on Zillow, and we've, we've made a lot of strides there. I'm really proud of the rental team and, and, and the opportunity we have there. So lots of interesting stuff. Seems like a lot of yeah. companies or industries with needless complexity are on notice right now. Um, and I would like to talk about one more time with Glassdoor. We actually won. Uh, we were the number one small and medium-sized business to work for. My old plug Gosh, there. I saw, I saw that. I forgot that. But yeah, congratulations. That's thank great. you. Thank you. Yeah. We're, we're very big into culture, and we've yeah. actually been meeting with a number of companies, yeah. learning about their culture. I was just curious. You've been very operationally heavy in uh, Expedia and other businesses. How have you seen kind of culture evolve? And this is obviously at the center of Glassdoor as well, rating yeah. company cultures. Yeah. How have you seen this evolve over the past 20 years? 
just the, the awareness of culture or the importance of culture? Exactly. Or the, 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 the way the companies structure their culture. You know, I think, I think Glassdoor is a, is a part of a, of a general trend towards companies realizing just how important culture is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an obvious evolution of business being kind of an industrial hard asset based uh, thing, capitalism being, an, you know, what ships do you own, what railways do you own, what mines do you own, what trucks do you own, uh, to what intellectual property do you own, mm -hmm. what brands do you own, what software do you own, what data do you own, okay? And what made hard assets was money, okay? And then the commodities that you were, you know, trying to lock up. What makes this, intele what makes intellectual property as an asset is us, yep. brains, okay? And when you make that breakthrough realization that it's the brains that are the asset of the company that are the factory of the IP that's coming out, now you start thinking about making sure that where that brain works is good. Mm -hmm. Is it a fun place to work? Is it, a, is, it a, is it a healthy place to work? Does that place to work have good values that I share? Do people support each other or are they jerks? Okay? That, I think, is why culture has become so important. And Glassdoor is simply an acknowledgement of that, an, an, an accelerant of that, and, and to a certain extent, a policeman uh, of that. And I really, I really enjoy that.